right. All right, Kate, while we're waiting, I'm gonna put you in the hot seat. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? Ooh, okay. There is this place in my hometown that makes a really good coconut ice cream. It is so good. And yeah, if you ever had the chance to get a really solid coconut ice cream, I would totally recommend. How does one know the difference between a good coconut ice cream and a bad coconut ice cream? Hard question. I, okay, <laughs> this is like too deep, but I feel like for me, it's like the like how sweet it is to how coconutty it is. You want it to be like not too sweet so that you can still taste it. Yeah, so, <laughs> so if it tastes like suntan lotion, you've gone too yeah. far. Because I think I remember I mean, like when I went to college, I um wanted some comfort food and I got some coconut ice cream and it was just like eating like um like stevia and it was so sweet oh ooh, stevia is bad <laughs> stevia is not good <laughs> one time yeah so like takes me back to like all those like diet ice creams that are like never um, worth eating and you're like no this is a mistake yeah I was just um listening to I listened to a podcast it's called you're wrong about and um they were talking about like diet foods and how it's just not a good idea like just get the regular ice cream if you're gonna eat it <laughs> yeah, exactly like thankfully that phase of my life is long over <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's probably a good thing all right it is 703 so we are gonna go ahead and get started so hello everybody, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Hallie. I am the Teen Services Coordinator for Fairfax County Public Library and I will be your host today for our author visit. A um, Couple of things before we get started. All of you are currently muted, which is great. If you could stay muted for the presentation, that would be awesome. Once we get to kind of the Q&A portion where it's a little bit more exchangey. Um, feel free to unmute yourselves. You can turn off your camera at any time if you want to, or you can leave your camera off. That's up to you. Um, if you have a question or a comment that you want to share with Kate or with I and you're uncomfortable mute, unmuting yourself, you can pop that in the chat and I will read that out for you. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, I'm also going to leave a link to a signed copy of Kate's book that you can order if you haven't gotten a chance to do that yet. I think they have eight signed copies left through the bookstore that we partner with. So I will pop a link into the chat and feel free to order those after the event if you would like to. So without further ado, I would love to introduce you to Kate Dowdy, <laughs> which I got right, yay. Um, she is a recent graduate from UVA and she is a debut author. So she has just written her first book, which just very recently came out and it is called The Follower. So Kate, I will hand it over to you. Yeah, hi guys. <laughs> Hey, it's great to be talking to you all. This is very surreal to me because I really vividly remember um, when I was in high school, our English teacher had a, a student who had written a book and made her come in and talk to the class. And I remember that kind of being the first time that I was like, oh, like if she did it, then like maybe I could also one day write a book. So it's very cool and full circle for me. And I'm very excited to be here talking to you guys. Um, I definitely want to make this like as helpful as it can be for anyone who's out there and interested in writing. So um, I have uh, some super brief talking points just about like my journey to publication and writing this book. And then um, the section in my notes that I have called writing advice from a scrub where I can pass on some of my favorite writing advice that I've heard. But if there's anything that you want me to elaborate on or get some more detail on, definitely feel free to ask some questions. And I would love to be as helpful as possible as I can for all you guys. And I'm very excited that you guys are here and thank you for tuning in. Um, so this is my debut novel. It's called The Follower. It's a YA thriller about um, a social media um, Instagram influencer family who also renovates houses and they move into a creepy old house with a mysterious past and find that a follower has gotten a little too attached to the property and spooky hijinks ensue. 
Um, it was super fun to write, and I'm really glad to be able to be talking to you guys um, about it. So I thought it might make the most sense to first kind of give a little overview of like how I got here and how I kind of ended up writing this book. It's a bit of a convoluted path, so you might have to bear with me, but and yeah, if there's anything along the way that you would like me to elaborate on, leave a question and let me know. Um, like a lot of people, I think I got started writing short stories and all of that really when I was in high school. And I was kind of like so many people I bet watching, like writing things and throwing them on the internet. And, kind, and that was really where I had my first experience writing any kind of long form fiction. Um, I was never like super into the fanfic community, but God, there are so many just very, very bad like serial fiction pieces that I wrote just like out there um, on the internet. But that was kind of weird, the first time that I had anyone in my life that wasn't related to me be like, oh, like, you know, you're kind of good at this. And, you know, I think that's where a lot of authors that you're seeing on the younger end now kind of cut their teeth was like writing on all these forums. Um, I wrote my very first novel when I was a freshman in college during the breaks on my summer lifeguarding job. And that was the first thing that I wrote that I thought was pretty good and that I thought it would be possible at all for me to try to edit and try to make into something. Because once I, you know, cut my teeth on more long form stuff, by posting serially online, I wanted to see, oh, but like, could I go back and could I edit something? and make it better. And let me tell you, one of the most surprising things I think I've learned writing is how much of writing is actually just like editing your own stuff, <laughs> which honestly is a lot less fun than just going at it and writing like everything immediately, kind of going back and having to have that editorial eye and having to reread your own work and be a little judgmental is intimidating, but super, super rewarding. Even if reading your own writing is kind of very much like listening to your own voice played back on the voice recorder. Um, but that was like the first big time where I was like, oh, like this is pretty good and maybe I could do something with this. And so I spent a couple years editing that book. And then I, all of a sudden I was like a sophomore or a junior in college. And I was like, oh, you know, I might as well just try to figure out like what it means to be a published author. Because I think at that point I had kind of had this idea in my mind for a while of it. One day I'd love to have my name on a book and I would love to be published. And without going into it too deeply, there are a lot of different ways that you can get um, words published out there. You know, you can do traditional publishing, which is what this is. You can do indie publishing, and you can also self-publish. Um, and I'm happy to elaborate on that if anyone is curious about the differences or about what it means. Um, but I decided that I wanted to try to publish traditionally, which means that you need to get an agent. And I had no idea how to get an agent. And um, so I did a lot of internet searching, honestly. And again, if you're curious, I can, um, there's way too much that I can say about the process of trying to learn how to properly get an agent and how to properly write a query letter and how to go back and make sure things are really polished. Um, and I think at that point, I was kind of sending a book out and I think I was mostly really hoping that I would get a very kind rejection that would maybe give me writing advice because, um, I was pretty alone in that I wanted to write like a lot of YA fantasy stuff, a lot of urban fantasy, a lot of like thriller like this book. And I think I was hoping that I would get a really kind rejection and maybe some, some words of encouragement. And instead I got an offer of representation, which was super exciting. And that's the agent that I'm still with today. Um, but, and so room before I said, oh yeah, like editing is really hard and self-editing is hard, but you know, it's even more fun is I think the first letter I got back from the agent representing me was like, oh yeah, this is like pretty good, but why don't you go ahead and cut 30,000 words? And I was like, <laughs> I just think I just like stared at the email, like having like a little uh, mental breakdown, like, oh my God, how on earth am I gonna do this? Um, and that, but it was super rewarding. And I can definitively say that like every round of edits that I did on that book made it tons better. And it really opened me up to a couple of the other like lesson, lessons learned 
um, in the publishing process, which is that um, hard edits like do result in better books. And also that things just take such a long time in publishing. I was really just so unprepared just for the amount of stamina that I had to have. Like I had never in before in my entire life said, oh yeah, I've been working on this book for like three years. Like it just sounded so stupid to say, but like that's, you know, what I did. Like I worked on this other book for honestly such a long time between you and me, maybe too long, but, <laughs> and then, you know, cut to me end of senior year of college, graduating UVA, this is in 2018, so three years ago now about, and sending that book on sub. And what happened when I sent that book on sub was that nobody bought it. And I will be honest with you, it totally sucked at the time. <laughs> but having a book go out for submission and not get bought is honestly not super uncommon. And sometimes, you know, it's you, sometimes it's me. Like it's, you know, the right book at the wrong time, or maybe, you know, I was just young and not ready. And it's something that happens a lot and even to experienced authors. And there's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. And I was talking about writing with my boyfriend who is a engineering master's student currently. And he was talking about this, comp this um, idea in engineering known as failing upwards, where you do a project and you expect it to fail, but you expect to learn something from it. And I thought that just applied so well to my own journey um, with writing books because I spent so much time on this other book and this book didn't go, but I think that was really me failing upwards because, because of that book, I got the chance to write this novel, um, which happened a few months later. My agent contacted me and said, hey, like I know this publisher who's trying to write a book about teens on the internet. That seems like something you'd really be interested in. And she was right, you know, I totally was. And that's how I got the chance to audition for this book, which brings me to the second part of all of this writing stuff, um, is writing this novel. So this novel is a little different from some other traditionally published novels in that it is a commissioned project. And I think these are kind of like sneaky. And I think they're a lot more common than most people realize. And what a commission project is, is when um, a publisher will get in their head like, oh, I want a book about this to exist. Or, oh, I want to have a book about Instagram stars. And now I just gotta find someone to write it. So they get this idea for this book and then they go out talking to agents and trying to say, hey, do you think someone would wanna write this book? Um, and trying to audition people for that book. And so when I got the pitch for this, I auditioned. I had to write um, the first chapter. And I think it was um, one of the, the very fun times in my writing career where I think I really got to leverage being a younger person and honestly being a bit of like an internet addict person between you and me. <laughs> into to making better books. Cause I was like, oh yeah, like I can write about, you know, engagement and sponsorship deals and just social media stuff like so easily because it's such a big part of life for so many younger people and for people that are involved in like internet culture. And so that just came super easily to me. And I was super excited to have that be something that I could do for this project. And I was lucky enough to be able to get the go and get the project. And I signed on with them and it was great. But just because I had signed on didn't mean that it was over. You know, um, the process for writing this book was really interesting because what happens with these commission projects is usually they have a bit of an outline or some general structure that they then expect you to write around. And this was my first time writing books kind of like like the same way that you would write like a class essay or a class assignment. Like you have the prompt, but now like I have to write the book. And what makes it extra fun is that for these things, because they already know that they want to buy it, usually it's on a pretty tight deadline. So this book went from outline to thing that I'm holding in my hand in just about 18 months, which was really a breakneck pace. <laughs> For me, you know, it was a lot of just waking up early to write, a lot of trying to figure out like how on earth I was going to manage to pull this off, honestly. 
And it was just such, such a steep learning curve. And one thing that this project um, really did for me was it gave me a lot of experience working with an experienced editor who knew what they wanted, who knew what worked best where. And yet again, tons of experience receiving very fun edit letters with things like change the point of view or cut this many words. Um, and it was really just a trial by fire for sure, but one that I think I, I learned so much from and that um, has made, I think, my writing a lot better. So that was pretty fun. And yeah, now that I am out here, like I've got this book published, it's been really great. And but one of like the things that I would really love to do in the future is, you know, I would love to be able to get an original novel out there. And I was going back and editing something that I had written for another original. And I could just tell that the experience of writing all these words um, really had an impact on my writing for this book. And I, I don't know, I got to add a lot of very fun personal touches. I'm not going to spoil anything, but I think I got to invent like a fake H3H3 podcast. I got to do all these really cool little like social media icons in the book. That was my absolute favorite part was making up like dumb comments for to be in the chapter margins. Um, you know, I got this book did have its plot outline, but I got to put a lot of myself into this book. You know, like I got to make one of like there are three triplets in the series that are all like social media stars, and I got to make one person like a beauty guru, and I got to make one of them kind of become disillusioned as the book goes on, and I got to have um, a body positivity like plus size character, which is really really fun, really important to me. So, yeah, this book is finally out. It feels very surreal, and it has been quite a journey. You know, looking back. Um, like I think I've been with my agent for like five years now and I'm just getting a book out and it does really echo that like my biggest lesson in publishing which is that it is such a marathon and very much not a sprint but if you're persistent you know you you can really get there you know not that receiving an email that says you know cut 30,000 words is going to be fun or easy but it's definitely doable you know I feel like people tend to look at the process of writing a book and just get overwhelmed by um, the, the sheer amount of work involved. But it really is just one word at a time. You know, if you can take things slowly, you can really do anything, whether it's writing a book or doing something else. You know, I really have come to believe that. So that's a bit of background on me. I had another section in this uh, spiel that in my outline is again called writing advice from a scrub myself. And I'm kind of in the unique like point where I feel like I don't have the qualifications or the age to really like give a lot of super sage writing advice, you know? Um, but I would like to share the advice that I think has made the most impact on me personally, kind of as I've been going through my journey writing and going from being pretty bad to kind of good at it um, and all this stuff has really stuck with me. And again, if there's anything that I've been talking about that you want me to elaborate on, feel free to ask a question. Um, I want to be as helpful to you guys as possible. But these are kind of my, my main writing advice, kind of top takeaways. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna grab some water. The most stressful part about this was knowing that I was going to have to drink water in front of people. And I've been like thinking about knocking it over this entire time, but we haven't done it yet. Um, we're gonna keep it that way. <laughs> but uh, on to writing advice. I feel like one of the most common pieces of advice that you get, especially I think as a younger person, is you get a lot of advice to, to write what you know like, I think if you Google writing advice, it'll be in one of the top, like, top searches, right? Like, write what you know, write what you know. And I think as a kid or, an, or a teen or a young adult that was always kind of like, oh, I want to write, like, urban fantasy or I want to write, like, sci-fi or I want to write kind of super unrealistic thriller that I've obviously, you know, never, never experienced. Um, I kind of didn't really get that. And then one day I was listening... I think this advice came from the Writing Excuses podcast, actually. 
And one of the people said, oh, it's not like write what you know. It's write what you don't know about what you know. And that sounds like um, super gibberish, but if you think about it, it's right about like the uncertainty of your own lived experience, right? Like I think especially for younger people like the, oh, like I don't know if my parents will accept me if I do this. I don't know how I'm going to do why. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't know how I can, you know, reach this goal or make this happen. Um, and I think tapping into like those areas of uncertainty in your own experience. And if you can take that bit of internal conflict, and if you can put that into a character, even if it's in a really fantastic setting, it'll still be a very good story because those are kind of the base character driven themes that I think a lot of really good main characters hinge on. So that is my, my personal favorite piece of writing advice. Um, um, another more practical piece of advice that I can't believe I'm saying is I am not a journaler, but one of my professors, um, when I was at UVA, I majored in English, which I'm sure is shocking to all of you. And I was in the creative writing concentration, which means that I basically just got to um, take my electives as writing classes. And one of our professors made us for a semester go around and write down a bunch, every thought we had that was good, like in a journal. And that is something that I thought that I was going to hate because I hate journaling. <laughs> but it is easily um, one of the best things that I think you can do. Because I think a lot of people tend to ask, oh, you know, where do you get your ideas or where do they come from? And everyone has good ideas. Yeah, I really do think that everyone has had an idea that could be a great book or a great invention or a great business idea or what have you. But I think one of the things you can really cultivate is learning to recognize like when good ideas come. So for this book, like I would just write down whenever I heard something that I thought was kind of interesting or inspirational. And it ranges from like ideas for novels to things like, oh, my friend said this sentence and it was really funny, so I'm writing it down. And, you know, sometimes these things make it into books, sometimes they don't. But I think just getting into the habit of having a stray thought and then being like, oh, that thought would be a really good plot, like for a book. Like, for example, I think my latest entry is that I've been getting a lot of um, those spam calls lately where uh, they just leave you random messages. And I had this thought where I was like, oh, what if you got a spam call and the message was like someone trying to contact you from another dimension? And I was like, huh, that's actually pretty funny. And I wrote it down. And I think just kind of getting into the habit of noticing when you're having good creative ideas and being on the lookout for them gets you into the habit of having them and just generally training yourself to think creatively. And I think that is just so useful and so fun. And then you end up with like a book full of random amusing thoughts you can look back on. And yeah, that's been one of the really helpful things that I've, I've done for my writing. Um, <laughs> excuse me, as I scroll down my list of writing advice just so I can make sure that I get all the good stuff in there. This, actually, this one is actually kind of important and it comes off of a lot of things that I think I heard when I was like, you know, I'm a 20 year old, I wanna write books. Like, I think as a younger person writing, um, especially in, I think of university kind of arena, I got a lot of people saying, oh, like young people shouldn't write, they should go and live life and then they should write. I've had multiple people tell me like, oh yeah, you should go live your life and then come back to writing. And the whole time I kind of found myself thinking like, what do you think I've been doing this whole time? I've been alive the entire time before this. Like, what do you mean I'm not living life, right? Um, and yeah, I just, I don't know. I think that you should not do that. And if you want to write, then you just should, you know, as a younger person, you'll really be able to capture the lived experiences of being a teenager or young adult in a way that a lot of older seasoned writers won't really be able to. And, you know, of course, with Asian experience, you know, comes a lot of skill, like I'm not trying to deny that whatsoever. But I don't know, I always found it very disheartening to be like so passionate and be like, oh, well, you should like, you know, go and live your life a little bit and just being like, no. <laughs> 
Yeah, like I think if you want to write, you know, people will always say you're too young to do stuff, but you kind of should listen to them and should do it anyway, because why not? Um, also, I would say try to find a community. I'm sure many of you have very artistic friends, and I'm sure if you want more of a reading and writing community, this library is a great place to start. Um, but I, I find that, you know, especially in the difficult times lately, when I've felt the most motivated to be a good creative person is when I'm talking to creative friends. And, you know, even if your friends aren't trying to write novels, if they're artists or they're writing short stories or they're musicians, I think kind of building that network of creative support is really important. And I think I personally find it very motivating. Um, I had a friend once say, oh yeah, like as writers and creatives, it's our job to uplift each other and we get there together or not at all. So I think finding that supportive network is, is really important. And I will give one final piece of scrub writing advice and then I will hand it over to, to questions and to anything else that the library would like to share. And this kind of, you know, goes back to just my own takeaway from the process of all the books I've written to get to this book, to hopefully get to future books, which is that you just have to keep failing upwards sometimes. You know, there are so many things that I have written that have never seen the light of day. Like sometimes I will get, I think I got like 40 pages into a novel and then I was like, wait, this is not working. This is a bad idea. This book is not gonna get written. And, you know, from a lot of objective standpoints, I've done a lot of things that have been failures. Like, you know, my first book, spent four years on it, didn't sell. And at the time, like, it really did feel like a failure. But, you know, I think the concept of failing upwards is that everything that you write that maybe does not get you exactly where you want to go gets you one step closer, right? Like, I failed at my first book, then I got to write this book. And every single thing that I've written that has never seen the light of day has gone into my vault of words I've written that have made me a better writer. And I think it's really important to kind of give yourself that grace and know that, like, you know, maybe this didn't be exactly what I wanted it to be, but, you know, all the experience that I have and all the practice that you get are just making you better. And I think that's really important to internalize. And yeah, with that, I will hand it over to any questions that, that you guys have. Um, thanks a lot for tuning in. And if you want me to elaborate on anything that I've talked about, just let me know. All right, we have a question from the chat from Kat. Sorry, that rhyme. Um, it says, how can you get hired for commissioned book outlines? Yeah, um, that is a great question. I got hired to do this book through my literary agent. I know a lot of editors will email lists of agents that they know and that um, they know have writers that are interested. And when I um, got my first book rejected, that editor was like, oh, like this was a near miss for us, but I'll keep her in mind for future projects. And that's how I got on the email list that was for this um, book. As for the original outline, I think that publicists will hire out like freelance writers. I know when I came onto this project, they had a pretty brief outline. They had obviously done some creative brainstorming. And I think a lot of that work did come from freelance writers, which I know a little less about. All right, cool. I've never heard of a commissioned book before. Of course, I know about like mm -hmm. getting commissioned to write articles and stuff, but that's really cool that that's available. I feel like it's a lot more common than people think. Like one example that I will use is that like, you know, if you see someone who writes a Star Wars book, that author does not own Star Wars, obviously. That is a commissioned piece from Lucasfilm or whoever owns Star Wars. And I think like there are a lot of Marvel novels coming out that I think are also commissioned. This is any book where the author does not own the ultimate intellectual property is going to be one of those commissioned works. And I think they arrange really vastly from like, you know, I want you to make a Star Wars book, go crazy, do whatever you want to here's an outline that you should write to. But I think they're all kind of overseen by an editor and they're all kind of commissioned out to people. Um, I can actually give a little bit more detail on commissioned books because my parents commissioned books. Oh, cool. Um, so my parents uh, are editors for commissioned books 
uh, they well my mom just became an editor for the books that she advertises and um the commission the actual author doesn't use her own name so it's not her name on there it's an, a, an alias that's actually printed under my parents name like the alias my parents control the alias and they own like all the property to it um but a lot of people on who will write solely for Amazon books are actually commissioners, do commissions as well. So my dad has gotten like, there's this whole conference that he's doing this weekend that's all about like getting a freelance artist or a freelance author to write a book for you and then have you um, advertise it for them kind of thing oh. mm -hmm. and there are a lot of different like sites where you can become a freelance author and then they'll like people who want a commission from you will go to that site and that site will recommend you to that person yeah there are a lot of different ways you can go about it like I know like for this book like I you know my name is on the cover I am the author like even though I am the author of a group project shall we say is how I've been describing it yeah and there are definitely like there's a really vast range of like for example like James the James Patterson series those are a lot like a lot of those are ghost written and they range from like you're a ghost writer to your name is on the book and you did a lot of the creative work like this true for this book um I will say if you are going and trying to find like commissioned book work online just know your worth and be careful I spent a fair amount of time like when I was moving to DC after I graduated I was like you know I work for a nonprofit. I am not a rich woman so I was like oh can I like do a writing side hustle and I found myself on Upwork and Fiverr and places will try to pay you like a hundred dollars to write 10,000 words, which is, you know, not good. So I would say, um, yeah, there are a lot of people out there that are looking for commissioned authors, but I would say, you know, know your worth, really do research if you're finding someone on a website. You know, I was lucky that I had like my agent to vet people and be like, oh yeah, like she's legit, but I would definitely do research and I would just respect your own time and make sure that you're getting paid as much as you deserve to be paid because writing is a lot of work. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, let's see what other questions we have. So Haley, I know you gave us already a lot of um, writing advice and like advice about publishing, but Haley did ask maybe what other advice you would give to someone who wants to write a book. Um, if you have anything else that you wanted to add about writing that we didn't already talk about. Oh yeah, I mean, I would say, Above all, it's important to just, like, be patient with yourself, which I know, like, to this day, like, I am currently in the final draft of, like, another book that I'm trying to write, and I feel like for me, like, I want it to be over, I want it to be done, like, I want this book to be finished, but I think just being patient with yourself and allowing yourself to take the time you need, because so many people are like writing, but also students and writing, but also working. And I think it's really easy to feel like a project is taking too long and to get impatient with yourself because I am always <laughs> impatient with myself. And so I think for me, if I could go back and tell my like teen self, it would be like, you know, acknowledging that like this thing, it takes a while and it's going to take a while. But if you power through, you can really come out with something special. Nice. All right, Kat also asks, which writing contest would you suggest or short story entries online to participate in? Ooh, that's a very good question. I have um, only recently been getting into writing Twitter and I wish I had gotten into it sooner because there are so many um, indie literary mags out there that, and there are a lot of them that actually focus on new and emerging writers and on younger writers. So if I was gonna go back and if I was trying to give myself short story advice, I would definitely say to go and check out the Lit Magazine. Um, I'm trying to think of specific examples that would be a little, a little more younger skewing, but I think if you just go on Twitter and you find a writer that you like, you can, I guess I'm on Twitter, you can find me if you want, but I'm following like so many Lit Mags and not only do they like 
have things show up in my feed, but they also give me um, ideas. Oh, here's one. Um, one of my friends from writing at UVA is the editor for a magazine called The Jupiter Review, which focuses on younger and emerging um, artists. And if you go on Twitter and you find them in the mentions, you'll find like 20 other magazines. And if you, um, I am, I am beginning to run like a spreadsheet for my own personal use of all the lit mags that I like. And so if you care to find me on Twitter after this, I can DM it to you and show you all the ones that I've collected, but there are so many out there. Like it's truly a rabbit hole. Um, but I would say get into that if you can. There is also a tool that you can use online. I think you can use it for free or you can do a subscription, um, but it's called Duotrope. I don't know if you use that, Kate, yeah. Um, and it will it will notify you every week of all of the places that are accepting submissions who are like, hey, we want a story about an alligator. And then you can submit your story to them. Um, and it keeps track of all that stuff for you. No, that's great. Oh, that's yes, exactly that. Also, I also subscribe to I think it's a newsletter and it's called Freedom with Writing. And it's just a list of all the contests that are going on. Um, so the resources are, are definitely out there. That's a great one. All right. Mary asks, what type of book do you want to write next? Another thriller, a romance, or a fantasy? Yeah. So the current book that I'm almost done drafting is an urban fantasy set in D.C. that I began, like, right when I moved there to start my first job. Um, and I think that I find that the media that I enjoy most is like fun, but also like low key, like kind of stupid and like doesn't take itself too seriously. So the book is about um, a girl that can do crystal magic and the plot revolves around like a wizard's duel tournament and based on like March Madness. And it's been so much fun to write and I'm very excited to be done with it. And I really enjoy writing it when I'm not annoyed that it's going slowly or not coming out the way I want it to. But that's hopefully my next project. Sounds really cool. I'm sure we'll all be excited to read it. Um, Brie asks, what was your biggest challenge while you were writing your first book? Yeah, so my biggest challenge with writing this book is that because it was a commissioned book, the author, or not, sorry, the editor did have the final say over the content. And I wasn't really used to being in a position where like I didn't have creative control. Um, and so kind of learning how to walk that line with like, you know, meeting requests, accommodating things and learning honestly how to um, talk to editors and just like navigate having work relationship with people in the publishing industry was kind of the biggest roadblock for me. I think especially because I was like 23 and terrified of every single person that I talked to all the time. Um, but yeah, I think that was the most unexpected and kind of unexpectedly difficult thing for it. We had another question actually come in via our survey that is a very popular question that Kate, I'm gonna let you answer however you want, but they asked, how much money do you make as a writer? Yeah, so I will tell you, I think making money as a writer is kind of a, it's a very broad category because being a writer covers everything from being like a super rich bestseller to being like a short story writer. And I think for a lot of contests and short story pubs, you like don't get paid much. For this book, um, this book did pay me. It was very lovely. We do love making money off of books. In the name of transparency, I will say I got paid after, um, after, because your agent takes a commission. So after agent commission, I made um, around $15,000 from writing this book. And that sounds like a lot of money, and it is. And I'm very lucky that I got to have this opportunity. But I would put in, put a pin in that and say, if you build me hourly for all the time that I spent writing in this book, I probably was not making more hourly than like your average barista. So it does take a lot of time. And it was, I am so lucky to be able to do this and to have gotten paid. Um, but it's also, I think all writing is very much like a labor of love. And so many authors, you know, writing is not their primary source of income. Like I think this money went into my, my grad school bucket or my car breakdown bucket, you know. But yeah, it's very, again, I'm very lucky and very fortunate to have been able to be paid for, for this book. But um, it's definitely took a lot of time, a lot of time put into it. 
Yeah, I think that's something good to point out is that, you know, most most writers do not make a mm-hmm. living off of their writing, unless you're like Stephen King, but, you know, 99.9% of writers are not Stephen King. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, Haley is asking, how much do you make off of each book you sell? And I'm going to guess that that probably depends on the book, right? Yeah, I think it definitely depends. And it's like, also is how established you are and how, you know, what, what, how badly editors want it. It's going to be very, very volatile. But, you know, I would say that like, again, if you're looking for freelance book writing gigs, make sure that you're getting paid fairly because it is so much work. <laughs> yeah, I interviewed a couple years ago, Karen McManus, who I think wrote One of Us is Lying, right? Um, and she okay. said that on, she had been writing for many years, uh, but it was only kind of after that book came out that she was able to quit her full-time job. Mm-hmm. Um, and she said that prior to her being able to actually go full-time as a writer, she was making from her writing like roughly $20,000 a year, which for, yeah. I know that, again, that sounds like a lot of money, but to put that in context, mm-hmm. when we live here in Northern Virginia, according to, you know, averages, you would have to make about $65,000 a year just to have like a one bedroom apartment. So there's, it's not going to cover all of your living expenses. Yeah. No, definitely. And it's a big part of that marathon, not a sprint narrative, right? Because like you can't, you have to be able to add writing to whatever you do, be it like your day job or school or whatever else is going on. And, you know, it really is one of those things where I think it's very easy to be like, oh, I'm going to write a book and to get really, to kind of get to the point where it becomes very work-like and to get stressed out. But it's like at the end of the day, you know, you're doing it for fun and it should be fun and it should feel fun. And finding that work-life balance is something that I am not great at, but working on, so... Yeah, to that end, uh, what is your writing routine like? So do you write like early in the morning or late at night or on the weekends? How do you fit it in? Yeah, I um, write in the mornings before work mostly, which is a lot easier now that we're all, I'm virtual, but I used to do, I wrote honestly most of this work, um, sorry, most of this book on the Metro bus going to and from my jobs. I had a very long commute. But I think a lot of it for me has been, was like sweeping it in before work, kind of getting up early to get a couple hours of writing in before uh, my day job. I would say also in the writing schedule thing, um, writing advice, advice that I hear a lot is write every day. And I think it's also important that you schedule in off days for yourself and make sure that you're not getting burnt out or overextending. Like, I, I don't know, I think that's by and, by and large the writing advice that I disagree with the least. This is my, 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 uh, my hot take, I guess, is that you shouldn't write every day. You should try to have a balance in your life. So. Okay. And as a podcast lover myself, I know you mentioned earlier that you got some writing advice off of a podcast before. Do you have any writing related podcasts or websites where you think they're kind of giving good tips and tricks specifically maybe for young writers? Because like you said, a lot of the time it's like, go live your life instead of <laughs> doing this. But any of those resources that you can recommend for, for the teens that are maybe a little bit more geared for them? Yeah, um, the podcast I was talking about um, it was Writing Excuses podcast. It's pretty good. I have been listening to it for a while and overall I like it a lot. Um, I feel like a lot of my writing advice in this current times, like, I've been really on book talk recently. I don't know if anyone else is, like, addicted to their phone like I am. I've been, like, on TikTok a lot and on kind of, like, the author writing advice section of TikTok. And there are a lot of accounts that give, like, really good stuff. And, like, there are a lot of, I think there's one, I'm trying to remember their handle, but I can't. I'll, um, I'll let you guys know if I think of it, who's, like, a professional editor and, has really good writing tips. There are also, I think, people that maybe are not, do not have the qualifications to be giving like super good advice. So definitely internet advice with a grain of salt. But I think if you want to be somewhere where you could interact with like really young writers that are kind of getting started, I think it's a really good, a really good spot. There are a lot of channels that are like, write my book with me. I I personally find them very like inspiring, so. Thank you. All right, any final questions for Kate before we sign off of here? I'll give people a minute. Yeah, thank you guys for hanging out. Um, 
if you want to reach me, I'm on Twitter. I am I have a website. It's called Kate Dowdy Writes. My email is on there. So you can totally email me as well if you need to get in touch. And if you have any other questions that you think of, definitely draw, like shoot me a message. Thanks. All right. So friendly remind. Oh, we might have had one come in. Oh, they said thank you. Um, friendly reminder that the link to order a signed copy of Kate's book, if you'd like, is linked here in the chat. It's also linked in the event registration where you register for this too, if you want to go back to it once we close the meeting out. We did record the meeting today, so we will post this on our YouTube channel here in a few days, and I will also send everybody the link to the email that you use to register for the event too, so you will be able to have that and rewatch it later on if you so choose. All right, thank you so much, Kate, for being with us today. And yeah, I hope everybody has a great night and we will see you all later. Bye guys. <laughs> Bye everybody. All right, I'm gonna stop recording.